every picture has its ups and downs. That picture just had several peculiar sets of problems. We had optioned that entire set of books, you know, because we loved the character, the Robo Show character. We thought was a very cool character um, to turn into a franchise. In those days, Hollywood was anxiously looking for more male-oriented action adventure stories that were franchisable. And Alec Baldwin was a major star. He was young, hot, and happening. And the fact that uh, he wanted to do the movie and Tommy Lee Jones, who was also hot coming off Fugitive, that was a major get all the way around. A long story short, we saw Heaven's Prisoners in Galley. In the Galley is the book, and we, we fell in love with it. And actually, I think it was Leslie, Leslie Greif that initially brought it to us. Um, and Leslie sort of had a, a loose housekeeping deal to find projects at, at Ruddy Morgan. Um, and so we decided we would option the whole set of books. And so we did an, I did the deal. It was an evergreen. If you made one, you had the rights for X amount of time to make the next one. And so it would go and so it would go. Um, and we thought the timing was good for this kind of a, an American anti-hero, you know, out of the bayous, which seemed very exotic at the time. Um, and so we were very, very excited about the property. There was not a bidding war, but there was a lot of expressions of interest from various studios, depending on how we managed to package it. CAA, because this was the early years of CAA as well, um, and Ron Meyer came on board to help us put the package together. And the first, actually the first piece that we had was Tommy Lee Jones. And then in getting Tommy Lee, um, we went to Alec with the suggestion of Ron at CAA and Alec came on board. And as we say, the rest was history. And then it came together very nicely. And Phil came, Phil came into the mix after we got the book and before we got Tommy Lee Jones. But Phil was a rising star. You know, he had done uh, his student film and he had done one, maybe two feature films. And he was a young rising Turk and he was a big get at the time. He had been the enfant terrible of USC film school and he came in, sat down, and he had a pretty good take on, on what to do with the material. And the writer that we ended up with, not, not the author of the books, not James Lee Burke, but the screenwriter that came in and did the final polish was his brother-in-law, who went on to become a major direct, writer-director in Hollywood. Forgive me, I've just forgotten the name right now. Um, and so at the, at the time, it was a hot script. We were all really excited about it. Um, but then going to New Orleans to shoot through the summer, which is hot, humid, and miserable, with, we thought, a pretty cool cast. New Orleans was very exotic, but it hadn't been used that much as a backdrop. You know, uh, the vampire movies hadn't been done yet, none of that. So it was kind of exotic and kind of mysterious, and the fact that we were going to be doing stuff in the bayou, and it was Cajun, and Creole and all of that sort of stuff, it sounded really, it sounded like a, you know, a fresh canvas. Um, <laughs> as it turned out, the people of New Orleans didn't want to know about James Lee Burke <laughs> and stories set in the swamps. And people from northern Louisiana didn't have particularly positive feelings to the people in New Orleans and were offended that we were basing, that we were actually basing the production in New Orleans instead of coming up and, and, and staying up there with them. And I remember having a conversation with the mayor of a, a city up north who said to me, boy, you don't understand. <laughs> New Orleans is not Louisiana. Louisiana is a state of mind.
<laughs> okay, <laughs> whatever you say. <laughs> How can you argue with them, right? It's their, it's their, their territory. Alec had some issues, uh, mostly about being on location in New Orleans, and Kim was going to be here in in LA, and she was only going to be coming down to see him from time to time. You know, it was a pretty arduous shoot, and <clears throat> tempers flared between Alec and Phil initially, and then it sort of lapped over into the general production with Alec being unhappy. Once an actor gets unhappy, they have a tendency to get unhappy about everything to do with the production. And so it became a little attenuated for a period of two or three weeks. But again, by all things accountable, it wasn't that bad. The reality of it was we had agreed on a budget and a schedule. And so Savoy was insisting that we had to make our days. Well, everybody wants to make the day. Nobody's trying not to make the day. But Phil was overly ambitious in some of the shots that he had planned. And so his attitude was, hey, with this cast and this set of books, they should put up a bit more money and let me shoot the way I see the movie. Now, Phil was in his <laughs> freshman, sophomore year of being on studio movies and didn't quite understand that, you know, he hadn't been given carte blanche. He'd been given a certain amount of money with the understanding that he would shoot the script in that period of time. But then it became manifestly obvious that Phil was trying to make the movie bigger and Savoy wasn't buying into it. And so ultimately, uh, the head of production for Savoy had to fly down to New Orleans, and before he would approve any over budget, he wanted to see the previous week's dailies, and he wanted to see an assembly of a couple of the scenes of the film. Um, <laughs> and then he told us to tell Phil that he wasn't going to approve the extra money to increase the size of the shoot, and promptly got on the plane and flew back to L.A. <laughs> And so Phil said, tell them to go fuck themselves. I'm going to shoot it the way I want to shoot it. And then if we can't finish the movie, it'll be their problem, not mine. Well, there was no completion bar. Savoy was self-insuring on the completion. So that put their neck and our necks as the producers and ultimately Phil's neck on the line. And part of what happened ultimately was they wanted everybody to put up part of their salaries against completing the movie. And at that point, Phil was insisting that if he had to put up part of his salary, then he ought to get to shoot something that he really wanted to shoot and convince Savoy that the thing that would save the movie was to spend another million dollars building this whole sunken set because it was all about an airplane crashing in the bayou. And then what was on the plane, this little Cessna plane, was there money, or they're just dead bodies. And finding a place where you could actually build this set and shoot this scene uh, and shoot it underwater the way Phil wanted became a major, a major production issue. So when we got to post-production, he couldn't finish the film because he hadn't shot enough of the footage yet to complete the key scene at the end of the movie that solves the riddle of who's dead and who's alive. And so everything was on hold while he shot for, I think it was three days, three days, maybe four days, in this tank that we had jerry-rigged that allowed him to do his underwater shots. <laughs> and then with much ado, he did, the, he did the editing to put his scene in, thinking that, you know, I'm, <laughs> I've got Jesus Christ, the original cast, and the second coming. And... So we had the screening for the senior executive at Savoy, senior executives, who flew in from New York. And to say that they were not impressed was a major understatement. Um, and so at that point, there was no more discussion. It was finished the movie. He wanted the shot. He wanted to dive down bubbles coming back from the camera like it's the 
like the diver going down and the bubbles flashing up and you're seeing through the bubbles into the into the Cessna plane, basically. And that was the only major conflict. There was a minor conflict on one of the nights and no big deal. Savoy had been set up as a, they were, Wall Street in those days was hot on the trail of creating new little companies. And so they had birthed Savoy, um, actually one of the ex heads of Columbia Pictures had come up with the idea of doing Savoy Pictures and he had done a private raise with the idea that they would announce the first slate of films and then they would do another raise and another raise and, and build it up. We were one of the first three movies, first four movies. But by the time Phil had gotten through building his set, shooting his scene, finishing the movie, Savoy had run out of money and they'd had no hits. And so they didn't have the money left to release Heaven's Prisoner. So Heaven's Prisoner as an unreleased movie was an asset of Savoy, which was then in, in, uh, in bankruptcy, was being wound up. And then New Line picked up, you know, just bought the library basically as a library play and then decided to, to issue, reissue, issue, whatever you want to call it, uh, Heaven's Prisoner, but it didn't get much of a release. It was sort of allowed to escape. And that was the end of, of Robichaux in the James Lee Burke novels, unfortunately. You know, and by then everybody was so disgusted. Uh, nobody wanted to talk about, let's go do another uh, James Lee Burke. Although a couple of years later, we did explore with, with Tommy Lee doing one more. But because by then New Line had released, actually sold um, Heaven's Prisoner, there was no great groundswell for it to be made. We felt, from from the point of view of Ruddy Morgan, it was a very frustrating experience because we'd started out with very high hopes. You know, here, James Lee Burke, had, at the time when we made the deal, he had already done seven or eight books. And when we met and talked with him, he had plans for a lot more books, you know. And so... <laughs> The truth of it was, we felt it had a lot of potential. But yeah, so that by the time we got through the whole experience, it was not one of the brighter spots on the Ruddy Morgan calendar. You know, we had two of those bad back to back virtually um, with Bad Girls and then with Heaven's Prisoner in the support. And I think if we'd have been in another studio, at a proper studio that had more experience, in knowing how to support us, you know, as producers, um, probably the outcome would have been a bit different. But, you know, look, I haven't seen the movie in years. I remember the ending of the movie didn't work. And in fact, you might as well have cut out the whole thing and much ado about nothing underwater is bullshit, you know. It, that's not what the movie's about, or it shouldn't be what the movie's about. Um, but sometimes people get hung up on something and they're gonna move everything around just to make their point, you know? So that's why when you called and said, I don't have strong memories, I remember a lot of the nonsense of the day-to-day -day and endless discussions to get to that point that you could go out and finish the day. It was negative energy, it wasn't positive energy. The crew was great. <laughs> they put up with a lot, seriously, you know. And it was a tough shoot because it's hot, it's humid, and it's relentless. We started Memorial Day weekend and we finished Labor Day weekend. Miserable weather. <laughs>